Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to EUC 5509. Had to look at that to remember. <laughs> um, so this session is Enhancing Workplace Mobility and BYOD with the VMware Mobile Secure Workplace. Uh, the title outside was the original title. This is the uh, enhanced title. Um, I'd like to introduce um, one of my uh, members here, uh, Stephen Porter from Trend Micro, who will be um, interchanging in and out with me throughout the session. And um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Marilyn Basanta, and I work for the end user computing group in the solutions team as a solutions architect. And um, we'll go ahead and start. Thank you. you can go ahead and you can sit down. Perfect. So, what is the secure mobile workspace? Um, I'm sure you guys have heard maybe from last year some of the EUC solutions. Uh, this one is kind of the update to the mobile secure desktop, or now the mobile secure workspace. And that'll kind of hint at what we've added and a few components. We're going to quickly cover um, all these topics here and go ahead and uh, go ahead and bring in the solution overview. So as you know, these solutions kind of came about because we wanted to have a very prescriptive and defined way for um, the most common way of deployment. You know, we saw common features, common requests for multiple customers, and so these solutions came about. The secure mobile workspace is, I would say, it applies most to um, numerous verticals. It doesn't necessarily have to be for just one vertical, and I would say it's also the most generic for most of the use cases. So let's go ahead and talk about the components. So remember, the mobile, the mobile secure workspace is all about enabling and empowering your end users with secure mobile access. You want to make sure they can get to their workspace and their virtual desktop securely. So we have our devices. So as part of the solution, we want to define how, these, um, how your users connect to your network. There are two discrete methods. First is the internal or your external trusted network. So in order to determine where the connections are coming in from the end user, we have our layer seven load balancer. And these fit in with multiple different partners. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. Now the load balancer determines where the incoming connections are directed. And it's, you know, it knows where to route these um, connections to the appropriate places. Um, remember, you want to set up a global namespace for these. All right. So the first place that the load balancer will hit will be the security server, which will then route to your con internal connection managers. We have our common infrastructure pieces, such as the AD, um, SSO if you'd like, your certificate authority if you have that set up, RADIUS. Um, we want a file and print server which handles all of our thin apps and persona data. You know, backup is also a portion of the solution if you'd like to have it set up. And here we kind of fit the common vSphere portions such as vCenter, vCNS or now NSX, vCOps for monitoring, um, AV which lends itself greatly to Trend Micro. And in this solution that we're adding is a Trend Mobile Mobile Security, and we'll talk about how that fits in to enhance some of the security for our devices. And of course, Horizon Workspace. Uh, this is the new piece of validation that we've done from last year to this year. And um, just to wrap it up, the load balancer pointing to the Gateway VA. All right, and then of course at the bottom we have our different desktops. As I said, the solution lends itself to different users and workloads, so that will depend on how you want to set this up for your infrastructure. All right, and of course the solution has three key components, the first one being mobility, the second one being security, and the third one being user experience. So we want to make sure everything's tuned so the user has you know, the best possible um, experience with view and workspace. All right. So I want to go ahead and cover some top-level things that you want to consider as you design and do this architecture. First is your TCP and IP schema, VLANs, routing, and name resolution. 
It's imperative that you guys define and understand an appropriate IP and routing schema for the solution prior to breaking any ground and implementation. This is especially important to consider when you're designing your internal and external networks and you're setting up your components with your load balancer. You want to make sure you have everything planned and everything set up. The next component are all the different AD requirements, um, especially for workspace. It has a few requirements and, of course, how you're going to set up with Vue. And if this site, you have, you have multiple sites, you want to make sure you set up um, your different um, forests or sub-child domains. The next thing to consider are your network security requirements and policies. Um, so this is very important because you want to make sure that you set up your data policies. You want to make sure you, uh, ha if you have governments such as HIPAA or PCI that you have your network set up. And you want to make sure um, that all of this, you know, these considerations feed into how you set up VCNS, which is what we use in our solution. If you're using, um, you know, different um, routing things and you want to make sure you have everything ready to go. And of course, um, you want to make sure your application workload requirements and your user roles are defined. Therefore, these are the things that will feed in how you're going to design your virtual desktops. You know, the number of IAPs you need per user, the amount of storage. Let's see. Um, and remember, there are different um, assessment tools that you can use if you need for these. Um, we also have a, an assessment tool called View Planner that help you kind of test your load before rolling it out into production. All right. Second is your topology for LAN and WAN. Depending on where your users are in the design, you want to make sure you enhance the experience. Some of these um, third-party things that you can add if you have a lot of users over the WAN or the things such as um, riverbeds acceleration or Cisco's acceleration. Otherwise, you want to make sure um, you can assess the bandwidth requirements. Um, a new thing to think about this is if you're going to actually implement uh, 3D graphics, you want to make sure you size those users um, in the LAN with their proper amount of you know, usage per that VDI session. And lastly, of course, are all your compliance requirements. As I kind of mentioned with the network portion, you want to make sure that um, you, know, you implement um, V-Shield data protection if that's what you need, or another similar third party to make sure you're compliant. All right, let's take a closer look at load balancing and namespace services. From the previous slide, here you have the major components for the Layer 7 load balancer. You know, typically a load balancer will require some discrete networks, so you want to make sure they exist in advance. Um, you want to make sure you have your VLANs and the proper tagging, depending on what you're using. Um, it could be expected that you're going to need to provide an internal network for communications to your internal services. You're going to need your external network. There we go your external network for communication to the DMZ and beyond the firewall. You want to make sure you have high availability for any of your physical device heartbeat traffic and for anything you have set up with HA or DRS. And you want to make sure you have your dedicated DMZ so you can route um, your users appropriately. And these can also apply you know, to your mobile devices, and we'll talk about that. And remember to plan for your redundant configurations. Make sure if you're going to set up your, your affinity rules and with the vSphere items that you have, every, you, know, you have enough nodes, enough clusters to have for your fallback. All right. Let's talk a little bit about Active Directory considerations. Um, remember that your AD directory structure should be evaluated before um, you implement our products. You want to make sure that your, you know, there could be security requirements, as I mentioned, that may have you to have either um, a trusted child domain or not. If you want to make, yeah, new new child domain. All right. Do you have enough resources? Do you have redundant AD um, DCs for your different sites? Um, let's see. And lastly, you want to make sure that you think about your public key infrastructure especially if you're going to deploy Microsoft Enterprise CA. This is, um, I think, one of the biggest places. Certificates are always a pain point, especially with uh, vCenter and vSphere. And you want to make sure that you have everything kind of ready so that way when you get to view, you have your certificates ready. And when you get to workplace, you have certificates all ready to go. All right. Let's talk a little bit about radius integration with the product. Um, 
As you know, um, you have a lot of great choice and flexibility with the different RADIUS partners. Um, there's also the RSA Secure ID. Um, some of these partners could be Active Identity, Semantic, SafeNet, McAfee. Let's see. So you have a lot of choices. Um, in, in our design, you know, we have it. We have um, given some instructions on how to connect it with Vue and some tips and tricks in our design guide. But of course, it's meant to be modular and you can fit in with any of your choices that you need. In our particular solution, we set up Microsoft Radius, so there are more detailed instructions on how to set that up with Vue, and it's fully documented. Just little screenshots of the configuration for you. Right. So profile of persona management is another thing to consider. So there is, as part of Vue, as you know, Vue persona management, but there's also other partners um, that you can fit in to do persona management if you'd like, or to enhance the persona management experience. Right. By having persona management in our design, we use stateless desktops. And um, we, you know you had to make sure we sized our SIF shares accordingly to the number of users. And also um, replication of the SIF shares in case um, your environment goes down. We can make sure we can restore all of our users very quickly and seamlessly. You want to make sure um, you test out your profile and tune it. Remember, there are group policies that you can set. You want to make sure all of your I.O. is well balanced. So this goes back to the testing phase of when you implement this type of infrastructure. So again, we, we recommend that you do persona rather the Windows roaming profile. If you are going to use um, Windows roaming profiles, make sure to not have them both on at once. And um, there's a few places of conflict. Um, we could talk about that after, or um, you can look at some of our documentations on what are some things that you should think about if you're going to use that. All right. You want to make sure you balance folder redirection so the data goes to the right places. All right. Uh, and then there's also uh, thin apps. If you're going to implement thin apps, this usually will be on the same file and print server, or it could be on a different file and print server, but you want to make sure that you set up a proper application cache. And if you're using app v, you know, uh, cache to, you know, so all this gets preloaded into the desktops and the user has a better user experience. And um, what Trend Micro can talk about is, um, what well, they will touch upon later, is you make sure that if you're going to have your desktops uh, scan with AV, such as with endpoint, um, make sure to size that and not to properly size that also with the I.O. Right. So there are a few general considerations I'd like to talk about with this particular setup that we did for vSphere. We want to make sure you leverage virtual distributed switch wherever possible. And actually, that's a good story. So um, as part of uh, my role as a, one of the solutions architects, we also have um, some demo environments. And uh, you know, we, we implemented our virtual distributed switches. And you know, we were using a hosting provider that we don't get to control. And we didn't do proper planning up front. And so now I'm paying the price where now I have to you know, rip everything out and re-implement everything just because I, you know, in the rush of getting our demo environments up, we didn't actually plan correctly. So that's a good pain point for me and a great um, tip for you guys. All right. Second, um, of course, your environments will be, uh, if you have multiple environments, you want to take advantage of uh, vSphere technology such as auto-deploy, host profiles. We heavily leverage vCNS. And now going forward, we'll take a look at how we can better take advantage of NSX and its new features as well um, for, you know, to handle DHCP, some load balancing, and um, the firewall. And um, you know, we have the new vSphere web client. You want to make sure you take advantage of the latest things that vSphere has to offer as well. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about vCNS configurations. Um, I actually love vCNS. I, um, I mean, I had used MonoWall in the past and different things like that, but I really like how vCNS is integrated with vSphere and it, you can take advantage of it. All right. All right. So let's see. Right. So one of the things when you set up, remember, you can have, if you have different user pools, each of these different user pools may have different security policies. Um, you might want to only let certain traffic get to certain places, so that definitely you want to set up your app firewall. One of the biggest tips, sorry, just go ahead and blow this up. 
The biggest tips is when you're setting up a firewall, I think, is to make sure you start with an open policy and you start locking things down and testing it. Because definitely, I've spent tons of hours when I said, oh yeah, let's just make a few changes, and I've locked myself out of something, and I have to go back and rip it apart and try one rule at a time and make sure that the traffic's going in for each particular port. So this can be an um, interesting troubleshooting task, but so the tip is make sure to um, plan out all the rules, plan out the rules for the different pools, and test one at a time. Right, start with an open policy and lock it down as you go. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about vShield Endpoint. Um, of course, you know this is now part of vSphere. Um, it's very open for you to integrate with any third-party AV. It, um, take advantage, it takes advantage of the security APR as part of vSphere. With this design, it's important to consider that while you're you know, eliminating the I.O. that you have, if you were to use in-guest AV, um, it is not eliminated, so you will have to take that into account on a per-host basis. Right. So again, fully evaluate the performance characteristics. You want to make sure you optimize this, and let's see. And of course, you have to prepare it. There are a few things that you have to do to the host to prepare it for AV, and um, you want to integrate some of these some of these bibs into your installation to make sure it goes um, more seamlessly. And I'm going to have Stephen talk about how Trend AV has um, deep security has fit into the product. Okay. So we've worked with the number of reference architectures and the vShield endpoint APIs is one of the key elements that we focus on. But in talking about supporting an end user uh, environment, it's all about the dynamic nature of them. So whilst the uh, endpoint API gives us potentially higher density, by taking that security task out of the individual VMs and running as a virtual appliance off to the side, we can drive uh, a better end user experience. We can drive better utilization. So you can get more servers, more VDI sessions onto a particular platform. If it's not in lockstep with vCenter, and able to understand when a machine starts, stops, moves, then uh, some of that efficiency is lost. So in our implementation, and we worked with VMware on developing the endpoint APIs, not only are we taking advantage of the virtual appliance, but we're also linking in with vCenter so that we can make management of your end user computing environment much easier. So as a VDI session starts, we're able to secure it very uh, efficiently and very quickly. So the virtual appliance is always up to date and it's always got the current pattern files. So one of the important things about looking at end user computing, the workspace and the view deployments is to think about transforming the way that you actually deliver security. If you take the traditional approach where you put security inside the individual VMs or inside the servers, then potentially you're going to be inhibiting yourself. So in this model, we're able to support not only the antivirus piece, which is you know, normally the entry stakes, but we're also able to extend it and provide other capabilities. So things like file integrity allows us to guarantee the VM that we're using for this VDI session or for this particular server hasn't been changed in any way. We're able to support things like virtual patching so that we can eliminate some of the challenges that you might have around Patch Tuesday every month from, from Microsoft, or the Adobe pop-ups and the other Java pop-ups that, that you get in a desktop environment, or you get in a server environment. So the key things that, that we've managed to do and we've built into the mobile secure reference architecture with the EUC team, and now we're extending in the mobile uh, reference architecture, is to drive efficiencies on the density side, to uh, enable less resource to be consumed by a particular task, which gives a better user experience. But from your perspective as uh, people operating this environment, it's about the manageability and the fact that we can address the security challenges. So with that, I'd like to hand back over to Marilyn, who's going to talk about more of the workspace capabilities. So just as a quick poll, how many have um, actually deployed a Horizon Workspace and used it extensively? So not too many. Okay, good. All right. 
Is everyone familiar with all the capabilities of Workspace? Well, either way, I'll go through it. All right. So as you know, Workspace is our real entry point to the end user computing experience. You know, from Workspace, you can have one location where you can get access to everything. You can get access to your data, access to your apps, and access to your virtual desktops. Um, so the Workspace V app um, is comprised of multiple different components. So when you're deploying it in your environment, there are um, very different considerations from your typical view considerations that you'd have to think about. Um, so this is what is exciting to me because it's, uh, you know, brand new and it was interesting to figure out all the pain points and um, things that we should consider so that way you don't have to follow the same headaches I did internally. So it's composed of five different VMs, um, the Configurator VA, Connector VA, Gateway VA, Service VA, and Data VA. So it, some of it lends itself um, to be self-explanatory, the Data VA being handling all the Horizon data. Let's go ahead and break that up. All right. The Configurator VA is really just used, um, it's, a central, it's a central wizard UI, so when you deploy Workspace, um, you do some configurations on the VM, and then it'll bring you to this UI wizard where you'll set up um, more specific user information, quota, policies, and those type of things. So that's what the Configurator v VA does. The Connector VA is really the glue for everything, for, um, as you can see, for AD, for your RSA, um, for syncing everything across the entire product. The Gateway VA is what we'll t um, talk about later about load balancing. This is what, it doesn't get exposed out, but it's what um, you would actually routes all the requests internally to the appropriate services. All right, the service VA is really what handles the, um, the policies and the administrative portions of um, workspace entitlements. So it's kind of like the connection manager, but for workspace. And as I mentioned, the data VA actually is where you store the files. Um, you can manage your preview server if you would like to and um, all the other policies for sharing. So here, um, one good example is you'd go to the data VA if something happens where a user didn't get deleted correctly, this is where you'd go and do these type of cleanup commands. All right. So as I mentioned, there are multiple little tips that I'd like to really share about Workspace. Um, you want to make sure everything for DNS is set up properly before you deploy because it will definitely fail and not deploy. And a lot of the time you'll have to go back, completely remove it, and redeploy just to re-trigger that portion. So it's something you definitely want to consider. Make sure everything can be um, resolvable across your entire network. So for the Gateway VA, um, separate from the load balancing setup, which I'll talk about, you want to make sure you think about your split brain DNS settings. What we typically do is we set up, um, you know, you have your external URL, um, in our case, um, vmwdemo.com, and from there, um, internally, we have it set to point back to the Gateway VA. Another tip, especially with Horizon 1.5, is to have all of your signed certificates, as we recommend you use a, a proper certificate for production environments. You want to make sure that the entire chain is exported. And this is definitely something that I see come up often with customers. Um, in the administrative guide, it gives you a sample on every particular section and order for the certificate. So make sure that matches. It's definitely caused some headaches. Um, Separately, um, you have to make sure you have a Horizon admin account set up in your AD. Um, this is what really takes advantage of, of where you set up all your policies and such. And um, you want to make sure if you're going to link, you know, view with workspace, if you're going to have users sharing different pools, you want to think about how you're going to structure your groups um, so everything gets synced properly. And um, that's something you guys may want to be on the lookout for is we are possibly going to um, help release something that will help um, further sync um, view and workspace together in terms of um, a self-registration type of portal, which is something that our group's been working on and that we used with our demo, um, our demo environment that we have for our field. Uh, and a few other things. Uh, Horizon Workspace uses Postgres for its internal and external database. Um, if you're going to do a large deployment, of course, you'd want to set up an external Postgres. We recommend using VMware's v Postgres, or you can also use Oracle 11G if you'd like to. Right. A few other things uh, with thin app packages. Um, Workspace uses the, um, you know, you can use EXEs or MSIs, but Workspace uses one and Vue uses the other. So you want to make sure you have the appropriate um, thin app packages set up and repository on your file and print server for Workspace. 
one big thing that I always see come up is in workspace where you have access to your, um, your desktop portion, if you're logged into workspace, you, people are typically logged into workspace for a long time and then all of a sudden they say, oh, I'd like to click to my desktop. If you don't have the global timeout set correctly in view, which defaults to 15 minutes, that user will click on the desktop and then they'll say, oh, why didn't this SSO me into my desktop? And that is typical with the timeout. So you make sure you can set the timeout to whatever length of time you feel is appropriate for your security profile and then the users will have a better user experience or know that they have to sign back in if they want to have SSO access to their desktop. All right, and a preview strategy. As you know in Workspace, when you go to the web UI, you can do um, you know, document preview. You can use LibreOffice, which is open source, or if you want to have a Microsoft preview server, again, that's something you set up on the data VA. Another thing to think about when you are connecting with Vue, um, you want to make sure that in Horizon Workspace, you set the UPN as a required attribute. Otherwise, again, this will break your SSO. It won't pass the proper user field information to Vue. And something I won't touch about too much is uh, Horizon data storage sizing. Just, of course, keep in mind uh, the sizing if you're going to give each user a 25 gig quota, that you size everything out properly. And there are definitely uh, reference architectures out on Horizon Workspace on how to appropriately size data and scale out a Horizon Workspace. I believe there was another session here on that topic that you guys can review. All right. Another gotcha. Um, that we're seeing is the fact that for the gateway VA of Horizon Workspace, you must have a reverse proxy set up in order for it to link it with, um, with Horizon Workspace. It is not supported to put your Horizon uh, gateway VA in your, DM, I mean, in your DMZ. Definitely not supported. Um, you can, the gateway VA also of course can't be, again, by not being split, it can't be split. Since this is what actually routes all the information, you want to make sure it's, it's very important that you route everything properly. You don't want to expose the gateway VA since it's so critical to workspace, you might have security holes. So that's the biggest recommendation here. And this slide kind of shows out if you're scaling workspace for multiple users and you need multiple gateway VAs, how you'd scale, this just gives a little preview on how you'd scale it out, but overall, make sure you have your load balancing set up correctly to route properly. So I know this is not talked about a lot in Europe, but with Horizon Workspace 1.5, we introduced the Android, um, the Horizon Switch, or the mobile virtualization platform. The reason I'm touching upon it here today is um, just because it's a very interesting um, way that VMware is doing this on Android. As you know, there are, uh, certain devices are now enabled and they're VMware ready. And if you have this component enabled in Workspace, you can then enroll um, these type of phones, Android phones, into your environment and you can have two separate Android environments, your personal and your virtual corporate. And from there you can push out um, the applications for Android exactly as they are and you can make sure everything is separate on the device. It is you know, an actual virtualized Android experience. With this we support um, the latest version of Android which is Jelly Bean 4.2. Um, everything on the phone is a native experience. Um, the um, OpenGL drivers are virtualized, so you can, can, you can still play Angry Birds on your virtualized corporate phone, but I'm sure your corporate policy might lock that down. Um, we have a, an Enhanced Horizon Mail app that this is both available for the virtual phone and for your Android phone for your end users, um, which you guys should take a look at. That's on the Play Store. And the whole reason I'm bringing this up um, is here. Sorry, before I, I jump to that, I'll say how it works. I actually recently just got one of these phones for myself, which is really um, fun to play with. I'm actually maybe one of the only per, uh, people in my team who actually still uses an Android phone. Everyone else loves their iPhone. I've always been an Android girl. So the way it works is that I go out and buy myself a device that happens to be VMware ready. I know that my company has Horizon Workspace Mobile enabled. So what I would do is that I'd go to the Play Store and download the Horizon VMware Switch app. And this app actually is very smart, or your phone's very smart. It only shows you the app if your phone's ready to um, actually be capable of using it. So that's an easy way to know if your user has a capable phone or not. Can they see the app on the Play Store or not? From there, um, all I do once I download the application is connect myself to the URL of my Horizon 
manager, and my IT will have already I put in my username. I should already be provisioned with that. And then once I'm you know, entitled in workspace and authenticated, it'll push down my corporate virtual phone and all of the apps that I'm entitled to for my corporate environment. So the main reason I wanted to talk about it here in Europe is that now Sony and these upcoming versions of phones will be, will be released with uh, VMware-ready technology without being carrier specific. So it could work with any carrier in Europe as long as the phone's capable of operating, and you'll, th these users will be able to take advantage of Horizon Switch in your environments. All right, so now why would we, um, one of the main uh, reasons we partnered with Trend here is um, we want to make sure we it kind of enhance the mobile security for the solution. And so with Trend, Mibo, Trend Micro Mobile Security, it could help with some of the use cases for mobile that Workspace um, doesn't currently handle. So for that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Stephen. Thank you, Marilyn. So how many of you recognize this guy? Anybody got one of those in their office? So one of the key things that uh, enabled us to, to start working with VMware on the, the mobile security <coughs> reference architecture is that we're extending the security model from the traditional one. So when we worked on um, V-Shield Endpoint, a lot of people were looking at VDI, looking at uh, thin client type environments. And that was the way that a lot of enterprises started to deploy their, you know, their, their work experience. And now with the, the mobile capabilities and the mobile workspace, we're working with VMware to extend that out into the mobile world. But these guys are starting to become much, uh, much more sneaky. So I would imagine a number of you are on LinkedIn or on Facebook. And what the, uh, the attackers do is that they research who they're going to attack. Because the old days of just splamming out a piece of malware are not relevant anymore. It becomes very targeted. And they're looking at you and your interests and your, um, your friendship groups, your work experience online, and researching how to actually start attacking you. And when they attack the employees, they're using all of the different vehicles. And mobile is one of the vehicles that they're now using to start attacking you. But quite often, it's not that particular individual that they're looking for. They might be looking at a weak link. So if you're a defense contractor, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, you're very strong. You have a very strong perimeter, a very strong security approach and an attitude. But the cleaning company that provides resources that you've outsourced may not have the same attitude towards security. So what they're looking for is a weak link that allows them to, to get access to the network. And that may be through a supply chain, or it may be directly through the endpoint that they compromise. But they're looking at different ways, and mobile is one of those ways. Once they're inside, then they can start traversing the network and looking for other things where data that uh, may be important or relevant can be extracted. So in thinking about security, it may not be the obvious things of the financial information. It might simply be the employee information, their names and addresses, so that they can capture that and then start creating credit cards and things like that. So these are the kinds of attacks that we have to protect ourselves against these days. And in working with VMware and building the mobile secure reference architecture, this is what we're looking to address. So you've got a complete kind of route there of research, attacking an individual, um, traversing the network inside the environment, finding the information that we're looking for, and then extracting that information through a command and control center. <coughs> And the mobile and the servers play an important part of that journey. So it's a bit of an eye chart. And if you look at me, I think you'll realize that I started over on the left-hand side. My, my first experience of, of computing was a teletype terminal with an acoustic coupler. I'm looking for somebody of a similar age. Anybody? Acoustic couplers, anybody? Yeah. So 
for a long time, it was a one-horse race. It was, it was Microsoft. And then it became a two-horse race with Microsoft and Macintosh. But these days, you know, there's a wide diversity of different platforms that we have to address and have to consider. But the key one is still Android. So I'm sure if we took a straw poll, the bulk of you would be Android or, or iOS. Any Windows mobile? Yay. I'm normally the only one in the room, so <laughs> thank you for being here. So these are the kind of platforms that we have to address and focus on, but we have to be able to address all of the different uh, mobile environments that are happening now and potentially coming along. So things like the, the Chromebooks. So in the same way that we're looking to create solutions, the bad guys are creating attacks. And it's not all about malware. But malware is real. So if we look at some of the statistics, when we were doing the research, we, so we have a big research community within Trend, and we were predicting that there would be 130,000 uh, pieces of malware for, for Android. Unfortunately, we got it wrong. And this year, it's got even worse. So these numbers and the gaps between the prediction and the reality is just growing. So in thinking about your use of workspace, your use of end user computing, you've got to consider that the bad guys are one step ahead. And how can you address that? Another thing to consider is that it's not always malware. So whilst the malicious bit is very significant there, if you look at the app stores for iOS, for Android, why are people developing the apps? It's to make money. Is security going to be your number one consideration when you're developing an app? So what we've done within Trend is to look at the risks associated with the mobile apps to see if they're being deliberately malicious. So you know, somebody has written an app specifically to target an individual, a, a uh, environment, or they're accidentally malicious. They've been poorly coded and left vulnerabilities in the app simply because they want to make money and get um, a new app out very quickly. So in thinking about the way that uh, you're looking at using mobile platforms, we need to look at the apps that you're downloading and deploying and also look at how we can protect against them. And the bad guys are quite often not just looking at the, uh, the way that they can attack you. They're looking at the vulnerability. So one of the big differences between Apple and Android is that Apple is very prescriptive. It will, when an app's deployed, it will turn on certain things, and it will make assumptions on your behalf. But have you ever uh, downloaded a, an Android app and really thought about the things it's asking you? Can I turn on location services? Can I access your, your contacts? How many of you just go, yes, because you want the app in there quickly? And some of those considerations allow the apps to get access to things that potentially you may not want them to have access to. So whilst the app is being deployed, and it may not be deliberately malicious, it's giving that app access to the information. And you know, there's a number of reports, and I'm sure you've seen plenty in the press recently. There was one in the register this morning about a particular application. So what we've tried to do with our mobile security platform is address some of those challenges. The diversity of different mobile environments, different operating systems, but also the key considerations when looking at protecting that mobile environment. So one of the first is device management. If you look at the way that mobile phones are given out these days, or you look at the way that um, technology is given out in a corporate environment, we're evolving from, here's a big old laptop that's you know, four or five kilos in weight. Please look after it. And we're now moving more to a bring your own device. Do you want to use an iPad? Do you want to use a Samsung S4? And you have to be able to support people bringing in their own devices or 
using devices that are being uh, enabled by the corporation. So one of the terms I've heard recently is corporately owned but personal experience. So the workplace and the end user computing from VMware is giving you the personal experience, but the device can be corporately owned or privately owned. And so in bringing those devices into the network, we want to be able to onboard them and apply a policy that says, these are the configurations that we want you to use in that corporate environment. So we need to be able to do device management and that can be uh, deployed completely within your uh, enterprise data center, or we can link out to a cloud communication server and use the iOS notification server to push capabilities out to the Apple. The other thing that we want to be able to do, which picks up on that threat theme, is to apply a security policy. And we have to understand the differences between the different platforms. So whilst Apple is very secure and is a secure ecosystem, you know, we, we can influence the policy there, we can determine certain things, but it's normally pretty secure. If you think about why people use BlackBerry, a lot of corporates use BlackBerry because it has a secure reputation. It's got the best server, it's got all of that policy management, but our Android friends have none of that capability. They have lots of open uh, APIs, open um, capability that we need to start locking down within the Android environment. So from a threat, perspective, threat protection perspective, we've got to address the same challenges that we have on the laptop. We've got to think about antivirus. Are people deliberately putting malware down there? We need to look at things like web threats. Are people going to URLs that you don't want them to go to? downloading things that potentially can be malicious, compromised PDFs, or starting a Java engine. So we need to be able to pick up those things. So overall, what we're trying to do is to address these kind of challenges across the different types of technology that you might be using with Workspace or using with your end user computing environment. Malware definitely is one of the things that we have to put in place. But we've also got to pick up on these, these other themes. The content filtering. Is it the right information at the right time? Is it accidentally leaking out of an organization? We've got to think about application control. So one of the things that we're doing with the reference architecture is we're looking at how we can deploy mobile workspace. The other thing that we've done in trying to address the security challenge is to really try and get a good handle on the types of malware, the types of vulnerabilities <laughs> that are being created or being exploited. So the smart protection network that we've created allows us to have two billion endpoints around the world which are reporting back to us challenges, reporting back to us vulnerabilities. And we can then make that information available to your corporate environment and to your mobile environment. That way we can address the challenges that the security, um, you, your risk and compliance people have. We can address the challenges that your IT administration people have. And bring those together in one solution, one reference architecture. But if you think about that mobile uh, environment, which is really what this session is about, a lot of people when they think about mobile and think about BYOD, it's a device management conversation. But hopefully what I've given you in the, the, the few minutes we've had to talk is that we need to think beyond just device management. We need to think about the data that's um, on the device, the data that's being used by those end users and the consumers. We need to think about the actual device security. Can we protect the platform? And then finally, it's the application management. If you've ever downloaded Angry Birds, did you ever check the name. So some of the pieces of malware out there emulate different applications. And we've seen Angry Birds with a whole variety of different spellings. So if you don't check the vendor or you don't check the spelling of the app, you could be downloading either a, a, a copied, a mimicked version of the application 
or a compromised one. So in thinking about that BYOD, the mobile security environment, we need to think about all of these different considerations, not just device management. And that's what we're working with, uh, with VMware on. With that, I'd like to hand back to Marilyn to, to summarize Workspace and EUC. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So as you can see, Trend Micro Mobile Security fits itself very nicely in integration with Workspace. Um, we actually, in our lab, um, just in the past few weeks, um, validated the Trend Micro Mobile Security. And what we did is we used mobile security to enroll uh, you know, a variety of different devices. And from there, we pushed out the Horizon Workspace and Horizon View app. And, that, and therefore set up the security policies um, to be able to define this. Um, so you can check out um, our integration guide that will be coming out shortly. So to summarize, uh, you can kind of see the mobile secure workspace can encompass many pieces and many components. And we've built, we made sure to build the solution so partners such as Trend can very much integrate into the solution and fit into the places where um, some extra features and requirements that you know, are required by your customers can be fit into the solution. We wanted to make sure that we showed you properly how to deploy a workspace and view and make sure your users have the best user experience. And overall, this lends itself very well to the, mess, the core messaging for end user computing is that everything is a virtual workspace. You want to make sure we can enable any pieces of your virtual workspace that you are requiring for your customers. To get some more information, we have the validated design guide for the solution, a solution brief, which is more of a higher level, um, some view design resources, um, the workspace reviewer's guide, which has very detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up workspace. And there's a revision for this for 1.5, but the, the link is the same. Um, and just a few more things for you to look, some switch information, some workspace information. And, um, Actually, if you tweet me, I'm happy to give you. There's so much more guides I could have put up here. I could fill up with multiple slides. So if, you want, if you're looking for a specific guide on something, I'm happy to direct you. And uh, just thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Silence, crickets. All right, well, Stephen and I will be up here if you would like to ask anything specific. Um, and thank you.